No, I shouldn't come in there. <laughs> After you. <laughs> All right, afternoon, everybody. My name is Teju Avilochin. I'm from Uncharted, and we're moderating this panel. Um, feel free to come sit close to us because it'll be less awkward than talking to you all the way over there. I'm looking at you, specifically. <laughs> um, so it's 3.45. If you're like me, not long ago you ate lunch. Maybe you sat in another panel. Maybe you're really tired and low energy, and you're going to listen to four people talk at you for another hour. So I thought we'd start this session by playing a game in the spirit of early childhood. Um, so we're going to play a quick just energizing game called Super Paper, Rock, Scissors. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with Paper, Rock, Scissors, right? So in this version, we're going to play like this. So I would, I would play Nikki. Okay. All right, we'll play really fast. Best two out of three. Okay. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors. We'll go on shoot. Sorry, it's my bad. Bad <laughs> moderation right there. All right, ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. All right, so I'm, I win that one. Yep. All right. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. OK. So I won two out of three. So now what happens is Nikki becomes my cheering squad. So she follows me around and yells, Teju, 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 as then I go and play Matt. And then if Matt beats me, we both become his cheering squad. So everyone stand up, find someone to play rock, paper, scissors with, and we'll go until we have two big groups at the very end in the finals. All right, go. You guys can play too. You can get out there, mix no, amongst the people. Yeah. Yeah. Do we put um, the microphone on? Oh, damn. Okay, well, ask, I'll ask them to turn off the mics for this just part, and then no, you can go ahead and play. Okay, we can. <laughs> What's that? We'll cheer them from here. We'll cheer them from here? Okay, that's fine. This game really is very fun. Yeah, this is good. I'm stealing this one from you. What's that? I'm stealing this one from you. This is good. Oh, yeah, do it. Um, I've played this before, actually. Yeah? Oh, okay. No? <laughs> Wait, are these the finals? Are these the last two? Oh, no. no. OK. Are these the finals right here? The last two groups? Wait, so Catherine, Catherine. Wait, so this, this is Matthew over here? And what's your name? Catherine. Catherine over here? All right. Winner, you're the winner. Yeah, all right, that's great. <laughs> all right, guys, thanks for playing our game. Hopefully, you're a little bit more energized and enthusiastic now to hear stories from the field of early childhood. Um, so, basically, panels are, are boring. Um, let's be honest. So the way that we're going to structure this panel is by doing some quick intros from the panelists who have been doing amazing work in the early childhood sector. We're going to hear a little bit from them, um, but it's really going to lay the foundation 
for Q&A. And we really want you guys to be very deeply engaged in this panel, to ask questions, to share challenges, to share your own stories. Um, so we're going to start just basically by hearing about who our panelists are, what's brought them to the work that, that, that they're doing, what, some, what are some of the challenges they face, and what are some of the opportunities they see. And from there, we're really going to open it up to general discussion. Um, the panelists have been told that not every single one of them needs to answer every question, uh, which I think will keep us moving, and that disagreement is okay. Respectful, but disagreement <laughs> is okay. We don't all need to reinforce each other. So um, keep that in mind. That's what you can expect, and uh, let's jump into it. So, cool. Nikki, why don't we start with you? Just tell us in three sentences about the work that you're doing. Sure. So. Um I'm focused on founder of uh, VersaMe, and we're focused on early childhood education, really optimizing the early years from zero to four, when 90% of brain development happens. And the most important input for that brain development is uh, language. And so we build tools and services um, really to help optimize, leverage, and increase uh, that language exposure in those early years. Awesome. And what brought you to this work? What's your origin story? Uh, education has always been pretty deep rooted in me. I was fortunate enough, I was single parent family and my parents, my mum prioritized um, education. And so it always sat, I had a 10 year career in investing and finance, and, but it always sat sort of pretty deep in me. And so four years ago, I um, came to Stanford to do a program to really think about my personal mission in life. And out of that program with two of my two classmates, now co-founders, um, founded this business. Um, and, it, and we were full profit, but we are largely mission driven. Um, and we ended up focused on this very early years where we believe you can have the most impact. Awesome. That's great. Thanks, Nikki. Matt, how about you? Tell us in three sentences about the work that you're doing. Yeah, so by uh, background, my primary career has been as an entrepreneur. I've started a couple companies. In this phase now, I'm more helping other entrepreneurs. So I spend half my time teaching entrepreneurship at Stanford Business School. And the other half of my time, I'm working with OMDR Network to create a venture studio, we're calling it, to help entrepreneurs who are focused on low-income, early childhood development. Awesome. And tell us your origin story. What brought you to this work, yeah, teaching well, and Yeah, media. what brought me to this field is I, um, it's really two things. The primary one was my first startup was uh, babycenter.com, which is still the leading uh, internet resource for pregnancy and, and uh, new parenting. And I started in the 90s. It's now part of Johnson & Johnson. And uh, it really exposed me to what I think a lot of people don't know is just the, the importance of the uh, early years and how absolutely critical they are and how much we still don't pay enough attention to it. So I wanted to swing back in this other part of my career and focus more on that. The second piece is I was involved a lot in a bunch of different K-12 education nonprofits. I'd worked at Teach for America. And part of my inspiration is to say, just like we've kick-started a whole movement of entrepreneurship, new people in the field in, in K-12 education, that same thing should exist in early childhood for obvious reasons that we can go into in this panel. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Luis, in three sentences, tell us about your work. So my name is Luis. I'm from Mexico, uh, born and raised. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am the founder of Kinedu, and Kinedu is a company where we encourage and empower parents to have more quality interactions between them and their babies. We focus on families with babies who are minus nine months or still um, in conception and up until two years of age right, currently. Awesome. And what brought you to this, your origin story? I've been an entrepreneur for my whole professional life. My previous company is a corporate childcare chain in Latin America, which is still going well. And during that time, we were a bit frustrated about how slow we were, because in Latin America, early childhood is still a missionary type of concept, and we need to transform the culture of the marketplace in a way. And so one of the things we did is try to answer the question, what would happen if we would provide the same quality of education we provide at our childcare centers, but for every parent in Latin America? And that's how Kinelu was born. Awesome. That's great. So for each of you, I'm curious, and we can go in backwards order here, um, I'm curious what your grand vision is for your work. If, you, if a magic genie showed up and said, what you, what you tell me, I will make happen, if you describe your vision very clearly, what is that vision? And if you can add on to that, what is one success story you've had that helps you believe that your vision is coming, that you're bringing forth that vision? So one of the things we want to achieve is that we can, we can give parents everywhere the tools so that they can actually encourage development in their kids, so that they ha know that they have to talk to their kids and they need to spend time with their kids and they need to do 
games and play and read to their, to their kids, no. Um, our vision is that every parent in the world can do this. Our vision is that parents don't need Gymboree or an early learning center to do this, but they can do it at home, where the nurturing is much, much, much more quality than you would find at an early learning center. Um, I think the only story I can share with that is that in Mexico, there's a, a consumer goods company that uh, has, is sponsoring the app and making the app for free for everybody right now. Mm -hmm. And so we, in our own little country, we are trying to live that dynamic. And now the challenge is not how do we get parents to use it, but how do we use the right technology so that every parent has access to it, which is a different challenge. Awesome. Thanks, Luis. Matt? Yeah, my, my vision is that we significantly close the gap um, that exists between kind of higher income uh, to children and higher income families and lower income families, first in the U.S. and then around the world. And the fact that uh, uh, there's just more potential to do that in the early years, and it's easier to see that particular impact. So I see us doing that by, one, encouraging the next generation of entrepreneurs in this field to really uh, figure out new solutions and new ways to reach parents um, and influence their kids. And then that should create a movement that would allow politicians and policymakers to prioritize this more, get more dollars flowing in the field, and I think we'll have a symbiotic uh, relationship of more success begets more interest in the field, which begets more success. That's great. And is, is there a, a story that, that helps you believe that your vision is, is on route? Yeah, I think, and we'll talk about this, it's obviously an interesting and challenging field because you have, there's, there, there isn't one field here. You've got a healthcare component to it, you've got an education component, you've got social service component. It's one of the few fields that's focused on a whole age range rather than a particular activity. But I think that's part of the, part of the opportunity now is there's this emerging body of science that we know um, that if you talk to people in the field, it's all kind of a lot of the same basic things. Um, and emerging technologies um, that allow you to reach parents in much more fine-grained ways and, uh, and influence their behavior. And so I think we're at a point where we're, we're just at the, you know, that formation where I think that the spark's going to start to fly. And there are many examples where you see entrepreneurs like we have on stage, many more beyond that. You see a bunch of academics who have actually applied their innovations in the field and are looking to scale them. So I think we're, the green shoots are starting to, to come up. Awesome. Okay, Nikki. Well, I have the disadvantage of going last here, so I'm going to be building on um, a lot of what Lucy and Matt just said. Um, so I was going to talk both from a sort of big picture perspective, how we view ourselves as um, advocates of a change in mindset to think about the early childhood years being most important. There's a lovely graph, or an awful graph actually, which it talks about, it shows brain plasticity being completely inverse to spending on education. And so we need to be shifting the dollars which are spent in the later years to this period when there's so much brain plasticity. And I consider us, and all of us, really advocates for that, that movement. And I think Matt talks about some of the complexities with these intersection of different fields. It's a very hard to reach period, which I think has been historically one of the, the challenges. And then if I think about you know, more selfishly what's the vision for my company, it's how can we touch every child? So you know, the, the first manageable big goal, I think, is can I get a starling on every baby leaving the hospital to be a smart companion, specifically with a feedback loop um, to both parents and to the broader stakeholders in a child's life um, to improve outcomes, to close the achievement gap, to increase parental confidence, um, and really change the trajectories of those kids right from the day they're born. Awesome. Love that. So transformation that reaches everyone is yeah. a theme that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing across all three of you. I'm curious, what are the big challenges that you have faced in making this work uh, real? Yeah, into? we talked a bit about this before. Um, I think one of the, the challenges or frustrations I've, I've felt is that a lot of what we're doing is serving less advantaged, low-income populations um, who don't have the capital to, to buy things themselves, and we produce a device, so it's not like software, I can't give it away for free. And um, there's a number of people who are excited and enthused, but won't put capital behind that. So I've been asked for you know 10-year, 20-year large-scale studies. Well. I spent three years building this and just released it, and so I don't have them. Um, so I, I guess I would encourage or like um, want there to be more interaction between the for-profit and uh, non-profit impact sector. And secondly, um, I'd probably like to see more innovation or risk-taking, potentially, around uh, funding to get some of these innovations off the ground. 
Got it. So funders are funding what's proven with yep. 10 years of data, yep. but that really stifles innovation. That's a yep. challenge you've been up against. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. Luis, what about you? What are challenges? I, I was thinking about this, and I think that there's a lot... I don't want to kill my competitors, but there's a lot of bullshit out there in terms of what works and what doesn't, and there's a lot of people selling, you know, hocus-pocus theories of what works and, and taking advantage of, of parents that what really want what they really want is the best start to life. And we, we also get accused of that. Like, hey, it's predatory what you're doing, you're charging for an app, it's not the same. But I think that sort of misalignment between what families want and are beginning to want and what some people are just throwing out in the market to see if it sticks um, is creating a really weird dynamic in the market for, for, a, for quality to really shine. And is this a challenge you personally have experienced? I mean, is this something that you faced on the way to, to figuring out something that works? I think or? as a parent, it's something I face. So I have wow. twins that are 19 months old, and then you, it, you go online and, and, and try to read or find something, and you find a lot of stuff that you don't know really how to discern what's real and what's not, or what's valuable and what's not. So it's a challenge for the consumer to understand it, and you, there's a lot of noise out there. And so breaking out from the noise is, is something that can be complicated. Got it. So discerning amongst what, amongst all the, the stuff, what is quality, what really works, knowing knowing that is, is a challenge for sure. Okay. That's yeah, great. so the way I look at the, the field is, I mean, its, it's strength is, is its weakness. You've got this bridge on the one side of um, this is a field, and I, you know, I spend some time in this field and some time elsewhere, that's very evidence-based, which is a good thing. And, you know, um, uh, Heckman is a Nobel Prize economist who's focused on the returns, uh, not only the impact, but the actual dollar uh, returns from, from that impact of improving childhood development pays off better than almost any other societal uh, bet that we can make. So I think that's, uh, it, it's hopeful that the field is held to a high evidence standard that doesn't exist in, in actually many other places. Um, and then there's entrepreneurs who are starting new ventures and they get held to that evidence-based standard. And so I think this, there's a role for investors to play that. Um, uh, even in the low-income world where it's, it's more government-funded to play essentially that venture capital role to feed the innovations that will then tie into programs that will scale uh, via government funding. And I think why it hasn't happened as much today is, um, again, because it's a complex and fragmented field um, and it, because the science wasn't quite there and the technology wasn't quite there. So I think now you have individual entrepreneurs who are braving uh, you know, the, the markets, and I think as you have more success, to me, I've seen this in other fields, like EdTech is a good example. When there were one or two companies, they almost all failed. Once you started having a movement of a lot, uh, there just started to be uh, more people paid attention to it. They helped each other, they pushed each other, they weeded out the lower performers. Um, they drew more attention, more people into the field. And so I think that's where we are right now. The two bridges are, are starting and, and uh, over the next few years, and that's part of what I want to do with this new venture is try to help connect those two. Got it. And you have a, a unique position, Matt, advising Omidyar Network. How how do you how do you make use of that position to address this this challenge that you see in the sector? Yeah. Well, so my work with Omidyar really came out as there's uh, well, there's just to me what's encouraging in the field just in the last three to five years a number of uh, funders, nonprofit funders, for-profit funders, a number of researchers have all just started kind of coming to the same conclusion that we can do something about this. Yeah. So really, uh, it was not a coincidence, it was that we were both kind of working on the same problem and, and I, I think we've made a huge amount of progress uh, just over the last three months in kind of devising what a venture studio would look like to support entrepreneurs in this area. And that's just because of the work that's been happening over the last few years where a lot of people have been thinking not high level about how, you know, the opportunity, but actual brass tacks of like how we can actually make significant progress and drive results so new organizations can get funded, new, new businesses can be built. That's great. Okay, and then one last question, we'll turn it over to the audience, which is, with all that you have learned in the work that you've done in the early childhood sector, if you were starting over right now, but you had the knowledge that you now have, what advice would you give yourself as you're starting out on, on a new effort to address early childhood development? Um, <laughs> I don't want to say don't, I wouldn't do it, but, <laughs> but I, would, I would, you know, I knew it was going to be hard. I doubled the challenge by building hardware. That makes it really hard, really time consuming. It's hardware. Uh, yes, 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 the clues in the name. Um, so it was probably better that I didn't know, frankly, uh, because it, I'm not scared of a challenge, but you know, when Everest is insurmountable, then uh, so I'm positive. 
I am positive, I am an optimist, an optimist realist, and uh, encourages me that, you know, events like this happen and there, there is a conversation, we are moving forward and people like Matt are doing what he's doing. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that, to that question. Yeah, sure. um, that's fair. So when I started Baby Center, which was my first startup in, in the 90s, I talked to a, a venture capitalist who was, at that point, had already been in the field 30 years, so we went back to the beginning. And his um, advice to me of looking at you know, companies over dozens of years is the one success, uh, the one factor that predicted success for an entrepreneur is if they could hang around long enough to get lucky. Um, so I think the main thing I would say to a new entrepreneur is like timing is, is yeah, yeah. everything. Yep. And I think there is getting to be more support in the field. Uh, and so I think a lot of critical mass is coming together. So timing is working in your favor, whereas even those who started a few years ago had, a, had an Everest to surmount. Yep. So I'd say, you know, I would, I would start now rather than a few years ago. <laughs> okay, so don't hang around <laughs> yeah, yeah, for yeah. a long enough time, Louise. I think... Um, <laughs> One of the things that, that happened to me over the last three, four years is that when, when we went to funding meetings with potential investors, I wouldn't say everyone, but most of them had different opinions. And I would take them all seriously. And you cannot take all the opinions seriously because mm -hmm. they, sometimes they contradict. And I think that, that my main takeaway would be to try and take the opinion seriously, but eventually listen to our own story and listen mm -hmm. to our own vision mm -hmm. and just understand where our true north is and just try to follow it. Regardless, if an investor wants to come in based on that, great. If not, maybe he's not the right match. Mm. Or she. Got it. So know what advice to ignore, basically. Yeah. And really follow your own north star. Fantastic. Um, awesome. So we have an amazing resource in these three panelists who are rare examples of real practitioners in a very difficult field, but who are making significant progress. Um, they're, they're here for us. And, and so, um, we want to turn it over to all of you guys. What are your questions? Why are you here? Um, what are you wondering about that this, that this panel can, can help uh, think about or address? Yes. Hey, thanks, everyone. Um, so my name is Elizabeth. I work at the Poverty Action Lab at MIT. And so we do a lot of work in education and early childhood development. And I was just wondering, because you guys talked about the difficulty of figuring out what research is legitimate, what might not be, figuring out what works and what doesn't. What is a good method for academia to transfer this results to the practitioner world? Like what, in what format would be helpful for all of you? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a good question for you, Matt. Yeah, the, the question was for ac academics, how would they translate their work Yeah, there's work all this into, research out there. Yes, right. How do you know? what research is good, and then how do you get that research to the practitioners who can do something with it? Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. And, and again, this is a case where um, uh, I think the crowd helps. Uh, so uh, you said you're at MIT, is that right? So uh, maybe I'm sorry if I'm provoking a rival, but Harvard Center for Developing Child is just on the other side of town from you. And it's a great resource for anyone interested in early childhood. One, they have a website that actually harnesses, it's kind of catalogs and presents in really easy to use formulas, the stuff that Luis mentioned. Uh, and Nikki mentioned as well, what are some of the basics for how children develop, how their brain develops, uh, uh, what, you know, what affects them for, for good and, and ill. So uh, one, that's a great resource that's continually updated with new um, science. And then secondly, they have a program to uh, focus on how you can go from an intervention that works in one population to expand that to other populations. And it's a very sophisticated um, uh, methodology to look at not just what works in a black box way, but what elements decompose the, the whole process. So you can say, what is it about this particular intervention that worked? What different sub-elements um, so that you can help figure out how to scale it? And the venture studio that I'm in planning is actually, I think we're going to work closely with them. It's a little bit of a trying to create a Reese's uh, peanut butter uh, a cup of a little bit of chocolate and peanut butter is even better together. Uh, in that there's, I think, the uh, business side of that, creating kind of the business model, which could be a nonprofit um, business model applied to any particular entity. That same journey of how do you translate this, how do you go from one step to the next, how do you scale, I think the combination of those two are, uh, the studio that I'm in the process of creating in their work would help, will help academics get this in the field. And for those who are not in the field, there's, I think this is one of those opposite of most fields, there's a ton of academic research that's actually quite applied and showing good results. So um, compared to other fields where there's lots of research and 
you know, the, the, the results haven't gone there yet. This is one where it's the, the opposite, so that's what gives me encouragement and excitement. That's great. One question on that, Matt, is, I mean, there's a lot of uh, meta-analyses normally in research-heavy fields that look at the research and assess the quality of the research. Is that true in early childhood? Are there, is there a lot of meta-analyses of the research studies out there? Yeah, there's everything from studies to meta-analyses to, it's probably a little, a little bit old now, but that, that center produced, a, or before that center created, there was a book called From Neurons to Neighborhoods that sort of is, I think, still pretty good, and I'm actually reading it as a textbook, so I'm about a third of the way through. It gives you a pretty good overview of, of all the research in all the different areas and not just the pure science, but kind of how that applies to neighborhoods uh, in their development. Awesome. Great. Other thoughts, questions? Yes, Stephanie. So we didn't hear very much about the companies that Nikki and Luis are running. Can you talk a little bit about them? Okay. Matt, that sounds like you, again. <laughs> I'm just no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, my company is called Versamy, and uh, we have a mission to help all children fulfill their potential in the world. And we started really at the core um, it, was in, it, came, it was born out of Stanford four years ago and uh, inspired by a professor there, Anne Fernald, who works in this field of early childhood development and particularly around the importance of language. And so the first product we built um, is uh, nicely modeled here. This little device called the Starling, and it um, is in essence a, a, a little wearable device for babies and young children, and it measures um, the quantity of language that they are exposed to. And then it's paired with an app where we gamify, uh, trying to nudge parents to engage more. So we give, we have a daily goal, we give sort of tips and tricks around um, quality of engagement and things they can do. Um, and then we are adding additional sensors to this to gather other input data on a child and baby's environment, again, to turn into actionable insights and feedback to parents um, to try and encourage uh, them to do the best thing they can for their child's brain development. Um, and we're, in terms of closing the achievement gap and reaching low-income families, we are uh, supplying to um, non-profits, pediatricians, libraries, speech therapists, and schools who are deploying these in populations of, of children to use to maybe measure the impact of what they're already doing or as a tool to leverage up that impact. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit more detail. Hello? Is it still on? Still on? All right. So Kinedu, it, it's, a, it's a company, we try to empower adults to have better interaction with their kids, and that means many things, but we started with our, we call it baby brain development app, and what it is, is it's an app that gives parents daily lesson plans for them to implement with their kids. Um, the, the app works very simple. You log in, the first time you log in, you answer an initial assessment, which are questions based on what your baby is able to do or not to do. For example, can your baby identify different colors? Can he walk? Can he crawl? If he's younger, can he raise up his head, etc.? And then we give you activities per day. Uh, these are video activities that parents can watch and then leave the iPhone alone and then go play with their kid. Then they come back and fill out the milestones again and it just keeps improving. So that way we recommend not only based on baby's age, but also the baby's level of achievement or level of development. Um, we're doing some, quite some research in a couple of of avenues, one of them is actually looking at the data. We've actually fi just finished a two-year project looking at all the milestones data we had. We restructured it, we clustered it in, in new different ways, and we're gonna relaunch um, the assessment and the app in a month or so. Um, and the second part is actually looking at the effectiveness of the videos, and we finished a, tr um, a small RCT, 60 kids in the San Jose Muse Children's Museum, um, and what we, sh what we found at that small scale is that Videos are more effective at conveying uh, activities purpose and more effective at getting parents to speak more, but they speak in more repetitive fashion than, if you don't, than the control test. So we, we need to do further research on that and, and, and see how that feeds back into the application because in itself, that's feedback for us to make the product better. Um. Awesome. Hi. Hi. My name is Louis Pugliese. I run a research lab for digital teaching and learning at uh, Arizona State University. And most of my background has been in the private sector creating enterprise learning applications for digital markets for um, early, early childhood all the way up to, to higher education and beyond. 
being inside the belly of the beast now in uh, the institutional market, it, it really is a profound gap between the flow of capital into the marketplace, maybe not in your experience, but by and large, um, the norm is the flow of capital into this marketplace and the invention and research that's happening at a university, the chasm is, is really growing larger. So what do we need to be doing to sort of exponentially scale some of these research-based inventions with a capital flow to actually get the scale that we need? So to summarize, what do we need to do to scale research-based interventions with the flow of capital? Is to close the gap between research-based interventions and capital. Great. Yeah, so I think, um, sorry, it's really hard to hear the questions coming yeah, back yeah, that, that mic, way. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, I think what, what happens is the field is, is, is based on um, sort of these RCTs. Uh, and um, there's this whole uh, body of work in, the, in kind of the startup world around lean startup and, and lean experimentation. So I think it's um, actually sort of expanding everyone's minds. It's really more a mindset thing, too, that we need to look at really three kinds of evidence. Uh, one is the lean startup evidence, which is when we're in sort of learning product market fit, how can we do some level of, of evidence? And even Luis is, I think, actually doing something well beyond what people do, where he's doing an RCT on a small scale. That, I think, leads to that second part of innovation, which is more of a quicker, faster studier, so some more of rapid cycle testing. Needs a different name because that's also RCT. And then there's still room for uh, you know, tra traditional randomized control trials. So I think, and this is where uh, the concept to me of having multiple entrepreneurs working on this, I think any one entrepreneur is going to have a hard time introducing the concept of let's get data from lean experimentation. But if there are dozens of entrepreneurs doing that, I think that's going to give investors the confidence to say, hey, look, these ones are <coughs> progressing a lot more quickly than others, and then some will move on to that next. Uh, sort of rapid cycle uh, testing. And I hope that will be enough to be one of the pieces that will close the That's gap. spot on, but I think the mindset shift needs to come from the investors as well, right? Yeah, so yeah. There, there's a volume piece over this side and then there's a mindset shift over this side. Yeah. But maybe there's, there's another challenge there is how, to, how do you pair up entrepreneurs and researchers who are coming up with new ways of solving problems? <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's one of, I think anyone who's an entrepreneur in the room knows this, and uh, I teach design thinking as part of my startup class at Stanford, and they, uh, one of the good things about design thinking is they come up with great names for very simple concepts. Like I have an uh, entrepreneur friend who's like, isn't design thinking just listening to your customers? And it kind of is, but it has a whole methodology <laughs> um, uh, around it. Oh shoot, and that made me lose my, um, oh yes, yeah, so one of the other concepts in design thinking is radical collaboration. And the radical part is it just means people work together across different um, discipline. So in design thinking, that's bringing an artist together with a business person, with an engineer, uh, and a musician, and great things happen. So I think a lot of the, the good news is this field is actually smaller, and so if we get the right balance of academics, practitioners, technologists, entrepreneurs, investors, policymakers, it's really not more than that. Uh, I think good things will, will start happening. The silos will start getting broken down. I think the other part I'll add, which on the let's be honest, because you, you started that, is that, you know, let's be honest, entrepreneurs follow, there's a herd mentality there. It's really tough. Social proof counts for a lot. So I think if we get more critical mass of entrepreneurs and critical mass of investors being interested, that will, uh, you know, uh, and we get the evidence uh, in this early stage stuff, I think that'll be the kind of critical mass we need to accelerate things. Hi, uh, I'm Kat. Uh, I'm an aspiring children's book author, and I'm interested in... Um, I hear that a lot of parents uh, find out about products and books through word of mouth, even, even like, you know, parenting tips and tricks. So with this whole word of mouth thing, how do you actually reach parents for your audience? Or like, what are the best distribution channels? Like, is it magazine, school? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I remember in the early days being told that um, I had an impossible uphill task introducing a new product concept into a market um, because of the awareness challenge and then the specific marketing challenge. Um, so on the consumer side, we are largely relying on word of mouth um, just because we understand it was going to take some time. Um, and then on the more sort of impact work that we do, um, where it's you know, organizational partner buyers, be it schools or otherwise. Um, we've, you know, we do a few conferences, but again, there's, there's, that's, that's quite a tight-knit community, so uh, one does find out about things from, from others. Uh, and the advantage is that has a bit of scale to it, so each are buying 
100, 200, 1,000 devices in, in my case. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a sort of multi-pronged approach, and sometimes, you know, frustratingly, you can't push things faster than they are naturally going to, the time they're naturally going to take. Um, so part of it is a bit of patience, which I don't do very well with, to be honest. Yeah, in Latin America, their Facebook groups are a big thing. There's, you know, Wiki Mujeres in Colombia, in Mexico, Lady Multitask. If you fly out there, I mean, if, you, if your product takes off in those mom, mom groups, you're all over the place. Like, these are literally 150,000 people, big, only moms, only women, and they're just sharing different stuff, products, you know, anything from plumbing to the next website that they want to use, everything. Yeah, and, and I'll just add this is a little dated because I built Baby Center in the late 90s, but we built it to be one of the top, it was really one of the top 50 websites, and it only served a small percentage of the audience, and we did it on zero marketing. And that's if you build, the, the good thing about parenting is, um, it's a, it's a time of great change, and people are very passionate about it. So if you build a really, really good product and you figure out how to get it into their hands, um, if it's good enough and on an important enough topic, it will spread like wildfire online, at parks, uh, in, in classes. And so the challenge in the early days is to be scrappy and figure out how you place it. And you know, you got to go to parks, you got to post online, and find those initial users and really you know, listen to them. And it, usually you don't get it right at first, so you've got to keep working until you have a great product. I think this brings up a really good question, which is in early childhood, you're a little bit, it's, the distribution is a little different than it is in maybe school-age children, who you can distribute via schools. You know, you're getting all these parents and kids together in one place, and that becomes one route to go for distribution. But when you're just talking about people in their homes, they're much harder to reach. Have you, you know, noticed that there's something specific that has to be done to get into the home of, uh, you know, get a book into the home or a product into the home of... Um, it's a B2C question. So yeah. it's, you need to get the attention of the end consumer all by yourself. Like there, there, isn't, there isn't a systemic channel that you can use right. that's not the app, Facebook or magazines or TV or... Yeah. And I think that's the B2C and then there's B2B. I think one of the challenges, and but we're working on in the early childhood space is there isn't one channel like there is in K-12 schools where there's a school district where 100% of yeah. kids are in school for, you know, uh, six hours plus hours a day. Um, so, you know, here you have health interactions where people are going to providers. Um, you have early learning uh, centers mm -hmm. where kids are going to whether it's Head Start, Pre-K, and home care. Uh, and, and then you have some social service uh, agencies. So those are kind of more B2B models and you have to figure out, you know, what's in it for mm. a, you know, pediatrician to distribute something, what's in it for an early learning center to use it. And there are a number of other entrepreneurs that are working on quite interesting things, particularly in early learning. Um, that's an area where the business is more evolved. There's plenty of existing for-profit companies there, traditional companies, and so I, I, we tend to see more entrepreneurship starting there on the B2B side. And even some of those, so we've sat and thought quite hard about this, you know, how do we meet, particularly on the, on the sort of less advantaged side of things, lower income families, how do we meet them where they are? Mm -hmm. and, and we ended up doing a, um, a, a pilot with uh, some pediatricians who were distributing Starlings, and one of the issues we saw was um, the attendance at, at doctor's appointments, even when they had the reminder the day before, was like 20%. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, even at that, what you might think is a reliable way of meeting parents where they are um, from challenged populations turned out not to be, which is one of the reasons when I think about vision and I think about, you know, they're definitely in the hospital delivering a baby. So, you know, can you, can you meet them there um, and provide information and, and have that as the first point of, of distribution or awareness? That's great. Congrats, you just had a baby. Buy all these products. <laughs> good, good approach. Any other questions? Yeah. First of all, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. As a, as a former entrepreneur, I get how hard it is to take the time. So thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. I'm wondering, how do you guys think about exits? And we have an exit with Baby Center. And we have Johnson & Johnson really taking it to the next level. We have Louise with your uh, rapid growth in Colombia and a couple of other countries. Um, how are you thinking about that next phase? And then Nikki, similar. You have capital from Learn Capital backing you up, private uh, venture capital firm. But what's so fascinating, fascinating about the three of you is that you're committed to the space also. And how do you balance 
that tension or that opportunity of building the right values into your company. So when there's an opportunity for exit, if there's one and if you're driving towards that, those values are not missed. I, I can start. Um, my thought is that the, what you want to do in the long term for selling or not selling is the same. So if my, my mindset as an entrepreneur is in five or ten years or whatever it is, you, I want a big company that's growing fast and that's profitable and that's allow, that can give off good dividends. Anybody wants to buy a business like that, no? And so the, the, the financial vision of the company is, is the same in either, in either case. The, the problem is not the financial vision. Um, it's, I, 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 when I think about what we're, what we're doing here, it's, we're not, I mean, making money is important, but it's just as important as it is for humans to breathe. We do not live, our purpose is not to breathe. Our purpose is to do so much more, but we will not do it if we don't breathe. No? And it's the same for companies. If you don't make money, you're not, you're not gonna exist. But you, you, we're here to do so much more. And for us, if we ever sell, it's, it's gonna be to a group or a company or someone who can actually help, actually fulfill the purpose of the company better than we can do ourselves. That's the only reason why we would sell, because the financial goal would be the same either way. Uh, yeah, I 100% agree with that. What would, what would drive an exit? It's, it's getting to vision faster, which is reaching more kids faster. Um, but I'll make a point which I often make, which is that um, if you're focused in on education as an entrepreneur or generally in the space, it's likely that money is not your primary driver. Um, you know, uh, kind of fact. And that means various things, one of which is that there are probably less VCs who are interested in you, but there are now an increasing number of... Um, investors, be it VCs or otherwise, who are interested in both making money and having impact, which is how I consider myself to be. Um, and so we're lucky to have Learn and other investors who are both interested in the, in the financial aspect of things, but also the impact metrics that we can drive. And so I obviously think about being scrappy and, and bottom line and reducing burn, um, but I'm thinking about impact and how do we reach more kids um, and have a positive effect on their lives, probably first and foremost when I wake up in the morning before the financial piece. Amen. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> so one of my questions, being on the foundation side, so that's, your, that's more of your risk capital, your true risk capital. One of the problems that we see, and not necessarily you know, your examples here, is that entrepreneurs are coming to um, the table all of the time with their solutions. And oftentimes, they solution very well for the middle class on up. But we've got this, um, from my side of things, it's hard for me to deploy risk capital when you're not talking about, their, that when the entrepreneur themselves does not have a clear grasp and connection to the social solutioning part. So it's a question for all of you, but Matt, I was wondering if you could um, address this, if, you, if you're addressing this with, um, from the Omidyar perspective mm -hmm. of um, coupling these entrepreneurs with these stakeholders that are really trying to make that change so that when they're doing a pitch to someone in a foundation, that they're, it's clear to me that they are so, they're doing a social solution that's blended in with a for-profit solution. And if you're not doing that, do you know of anybody that is doing that? Yeah, so um, good, good question, and I'm, I'm glad because I, I glad to talk about the nonprofit and the traditional foundation side. We're not in the studio we're going to create. We're agnostic as to what the business model is, and so we haven't had for-profit examples up here. But um, I think actually a lot in low-income early childhood development in the U.S. will be nonprofit. And I think to me the gap I see is it's actually a mindset uh, gap to be blunt. And, and I'm, uh, uh, I haven't talked to as many traditional foundations, but my sense is the, the issue is the way foundations funding is they fund projects, they fund specific things, and that's just a fundamental mismatch with a lot of nonprofit entrepreneurs, of which there are many out there who are very much focused on a low-income market, but they have to go through the same sort of lean experimentation and iteration on only their products to find a product that works for whatever audience it is, 
but also on their business model. And for a nonprofit business model, that could be, all right, I want to sell into, you know, into pediatricians, I want to sell into early learning centers. So I think the um, traditional uh, foundations need to work with, I, I'm, I'm uh, a consultant to OMDR, so I'm not tooting our own horn, but like OMDR and other uh, groups that fund both traditional, fund both uh, nonprofits and for-profits, they've done a good job of thinking of like, how do we bridge that gap? And so I think there are ways for foundations to deploy their capital, essentially their non, you know, their their grants in the same model that people are doing on the for-profit side, and that's a huge that's a huge thing that we have to change in the field. So it's not about the issue is not about convincing people to focus on low income. It's it's all around how do you help entrepreneurs go from step one to step two to step three on, on building their solution and then building their their business model. And I don't want to sound defensive, but we considered starting our business as a non-profit and made a very deliberate decision not to for a couple of reasons. One, we didn't want to be dependent on handouts, to, to put it one way. But, and secondly, we have an aspiration to become you know, self-supporting or subsidizing the supply and distribution to less advantaged, low-income families. So think Thomas Shoes, if you will. Um, so it was a very deliberate and conscious decision um, to do that. And I don't think it... Uh, you know, it definitely doesn't lessen any of my desire to really make a difference in, on, the, on the lives of the less advantaged. I think, I think one thing I'd be curious just to follow up on that is, uh, you know, with low-income populations, you're having to make trade-offs between things like rent and food and education. And that's actually, I think, often the way that people prioritize meeting their needs is they start by paying their rent if they have money left over, then they might buy food, but they're willing to sacrifice food for rent. And if they have money left over after that, then they think about educating their, their kids. How does that ordering of priorities when you're talking about low-income communities actually affect how an entrepreneur needs to design a solution to, to really make, get traction in, in, in these communities? Yeah, well, I think I'd say two things, and one goes against my business a little bit, one of which is that there is uh, funding from uh, be it state or other organizations aimed at serving and helping these people get out of their situation. So they may not be actually paying for whatever the service the is that they're, that, that they're receiving. Oh, there's evidence which says that if they don't pay anything, they don't value it in any of us as humans. Um, the other thing I'd say, and, and um, uh, research has been done by the Kenneth Raynham Foundation on this, um, is that the um, smartphone uh, penetration in low-income population is like close to 100% now. So that is going up, um, what's the hierarchy of needs? You know, that, that's coming closer to the, to the top. And so we are in a, in a world where deployment of information technology, if we think about apps and, and what Kinesi provides, you know, it can be done at lower and lower costs. Or even, you know, there's plenty of text messaging programs out there, which we won't debate the merits of, but again, it can be done at pretty low cost. So I think, you know, we are in an age where it is becoming more possible to reach the hard to reach um, in a low cost way. Yeah, the other thing I'll add is I think for a low income population, I, I don't think if your business model is counting on, on parent pay, I think that's, a, that's not going to work. Yeah. So a lot of this is about, in essence, government funding, federal, state, local, um, health, uh, you know, education, social service. There's money there. There's not enough of it. We're going to try to change that. But there, are, there is money there. And I think that where you get into nonprofit, for-profit, I think, uh, one, I, I don't, we don't know yet. We'll see how that, that emerges. But I think you'll see more nonprofits around the delivery model. So just the way you see it in the world today, you'll see more early learning centers if you're, you know, uh, uh, health clinics, things like that. That would probably be where you'd find more nonprofit models. And I think you'd find the for-profit models where you see it today in low-income populations that there's a lot of back office solutions if you're trying to run, <coughs> build software for early learning centers. Um, that's probably going to be for profit. I think data companies as well. And just again, in the early learning and health world, there's new emerging data, um, you know, around kind of both from the biomarker side as well as from the, like you guys are going to generate a, uh, data um, that can actually help pediatricians, help social service agents, whether it's compliance things like not attending a, a pediatric visit or, uh, you know, word spoken, uh, you know, child development milestones. So um, I think the business model will vary based on the kind of company, but it's all. This, is, this isn't going to be based on, on uh, self-pay by Yeah, but by you, you hit on a, very, on a very nice point, which is just the creation of different innovations in early childhood creates externalities 
uh, apart from those that the consumer is willing to pay. And, and I'll, you, you gave a great example. So we, we are all going to generate data that we can share and that for us it's just marginal, it's not part of the business model. There are things we can do as, like I think foundations could take bigger risks and just support the ecosystem as a whole. Because if we have more yeah. ideas, the, the more externalities we can produce. And that was something that, happened, that was mentioned in the morning uh, by the Fed, Minnesota Fed guy who said, you know, most of the dollars from early childhood investment are captured by society, not by the actual recipient of help. And it's the same thing when supporting the ecosystem of entrepreneurship in early childhood. The innovation, the data that comes out, the, the investment and distribution models is something that other people, not necessarily the, the exact entrepreneurs you're funding, will take advantage of. But that data that we're generating, like we have the biggest, the largest database collected of, of early childhood milestones observations. Why are we doing it? We're, we're doing research with it. And after that, we're gonna rebuild the assessment and give it for free to pediatricians. That's something that happened funding a business that's mostly targeted at, low, at higher income families. No? So I think that there is something to say for the externalities of investing in early childhood as a whole and not just on those that fulfill specific targeted missions. Yeah, I mean, if we look at, if you refer to Heckman's work, which you did earlier, Matt, and, and talking about generally the return on capital invested during those early years, um, and that's, you know, from a bigger picture perspective rather than any individual solution service company, et cetera. So I guess what I'm hearing is if you're a for-profit, your payer is not the low-income parent, but if you're a funder interested in driving results for low-income communities, you've got to look at the payoff for society by investing in early childhood rather than the payoff for a specific business. Is that, is that fair, fair summary? Yeah. 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 Luis, would you well, clarify? Well, you, you, as the entrepreneur, you could also find out who's going to pay. When we launched the corporate child care in Mexico, our average cost per month per child was like $350. I know that's nothing in the U.S., but it was like two and a half times what the average child care cost in Mexico. And so we got companies to pay for it. It took us like four years, but we got companies to pay for it. Got it. Somebody is willing to pay. Somebody, why? Because there's an externality to providing the service. Mm. We just need to find that someone. Got it. It's great. It's good stuff here. Yeah, Luis or this gentleman here. <clears throat> Minneapolis fat guy. Thank you, um, I missed it. We didn't hear what you said. Oh, the Minneapolis, the Minneapolis fat guy. Oh, Minnesota fat guy. <laughs> Sorry. No, that was good. Um, yeah, any publicity is good publicity. So, uh, how does your, how do your companies engage with the public sector, and is there a policy change that could happen in the public sector that would be beneficial to your mission? So I'll answer that in two okay. parts. The first one is how we engage. We do, we, anything that comes from foundations, um, government institutions that want to use our software for early learning centers or families as, as home visiting interventions or training for uh, caregivers, we do it for free. As a ge general policy within the company, that we, we're working with Fundación Alas to take this to Panama and we're working with remote communities, Fundación Alas is, is pitching in uh, cell phone and tablet signals, but we do everything we do with them for free. That's how we engage. Whatever, whatever we can do to help, we do. In terms of policy change, I don't know in Mexico what can happen. I mean, it's hard to say, it's hard to see policy around, around apps for early childhood changing or actually being relevant. What's more important in early childhood, it's other things. It's home visiting programs, it's early learning centers. I don't see, I don't see policy changing for us for me in my own personal way soon. Yeah, and I would say as the uh, Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis Fed guy and hopefully the, the data guy, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of fields that generate a lot of data. You know, the NIH does a lot of research and that leads to data. The Fed, you do a lot of programs to promote use of, of data. I think with new technologies, including from for-profit as well as from non-profit companies, there's a whole new sets of data that can be created. For, you know, for instance, Nikki's generating data on words spoken, which is one of the um, you know, predictors of, of child development. There's wrinkles around, it's not just pure word spoken, but, but you can get around that. But that, those kind of data sets can be created, and I think you can measure what impact uh, you have, and then you can create public policy programs around it. And I think this is a case where it really takes for-profit, non-profit investors, you know, entrepreneurs and policymakers um, 
with a uh, probably a competitor of yours, so sorry to, to give them a plug, and they're a, the nonprofit. Um, Bloomberg uh, Foundation, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies funded a Providence, Rhode Island to do a program called Providence Talks, which is something that you know, uh, Nikki would be a proponent of, a voluntary program to help parents track their words spoken and, and education intervention. Uh, again, it took some seed capital from a, a nonprofit, uh, from, from a traditional, um, uh, you know, funder. Uh, they paired with city government. That city government is now looking at how can we expand that elsewhere. And so I think there will be a lot of kind of community, you know, local, state, and federal-based programs that can be actually you know, hard evidence-based programs, and so you probably know better what element of data, what element of funding is going to be needed to pull together, but I think you've got creative entrepreneurs who will step in the void and, and, and sort of help generate those results. Matt, really fast on that, and Nikki, I want to hear your thoughts on this, but there's a, you mentioned that a lot of for-profits in this field are using data somehow. I mean, do you think there's a role for foundations and government to buy data from entrepreneurs and not be a business model that can work? If you're serving a low-income population, you're generating insights into what might yeah, be Yeah, I think it's, it's in the externality model. So I think, you know, I hope foundations fund some of the work that, you know, um, the Nikki and Luis are doing because actually foundations do, spe you know, they do spend money on we want to do a, a program in this area and it's going to cost X dollars and we're going to give kids iPads or parents iPads so we can test this. They all, you know, they've already done the R&D, and so you could leverage a Starling to, you know, collect data, you know, influence behavior, and at the same time collect data yeah. in a pretty cost-effective way. Yeah. You could even get it subsidized by a corporation. You can go to Target and say, hey, this is a good community-wide effort. Target's going to look good if you fund $50, you know, per student. That's going to fund a lot of her costs. So I think foundations can help play a role in buying some of these products out of their own self-interest to actually influence kids and in the process generate data and I think that'll get to a virtuous cycle of other innovations. No, I was just going to have a gripe that if we uh, had a different administration then more might have been focused on early childhood, um, but, uh, but we shouldn't get political. So. <laughs> one other question out there. This will be our last question. Thanks so much. Uh, Elliot Pence with uh, AXN. Um, I had a double barrel question. The first was related to data. Who owns your data? Uh, is there sensitivities with the parents, obviously, in the data? Um, uh, second, what are you seeing cross-culturally? So how does a Nigerian parent or child different from a Mexican or American? And what are those sort of top two interesting trends that you're seeing uh, that maybe push back against be best practices? So, uh, in answer to your first question, uh, we own our data, um, but I definitely would be open to making that available to the extent it doesn't threaten our IP. Um, if it's going to move the field forward, be it more broadly, be it for specific research or otherwise, um, and I'm in dialogue with a number of researchers on, on that topic. Um, I'm just going to give you an anecdote on the second part of your question, which is um, differences, and I know Luis will have an opinion on this as well, but as we think about, you know, if you believe in one of the critical messages we're pushing around, engagement and language. Um, culturally, in, s in some places, it's actually not, um, not promoted to talk to your children. They should be sat in the corner, ignored. Um, Anne Fernald, who's our professor at Stanford, she's done some research in um, places in Africa where actually if you look a child in the eye, then there's this concept of the evil eye. And so, you know, how, how do you even start encouraging more language if, if, if culturally you're not supposed to look at your child? Um, and, I, and I don't have any good answer on, on how to address that, but I think it is something we... Uh, we, we need to think about it and should be thinking about it um, as we, you know, being culturally sensitive as we promote best practices and, and, and things that we're seeing come out of research. So for us, it's similar. We, parents own the data linked to their name, but we own the right to use the data anonymously for research purposes and aggregate it and all that. Yeah. Um, in terms of what difference are, are we seeing per country or socioeconomic level, that's what we're starting in November, and it's going to take us... 12 months or so to do all the correlations within the milestones and it's going to take us a while. So ask me in a couple of years. <laughs> and, and I'll add one thing, I mean it sounds trite but it's really true. Parents, uh, you know, new parents want the best for their kids no matter what environment they're in and uh, early learning, you know, um, Catherine's here from Early Learning Lab, they did some research. You might define what success is for your kids differently based on where you are, you know, what community you're in. 
but uh, everyone pretty much wants the best for their kids. And parenting is the great leveler, so uh, mm. everyone is kind of humbled in a, you know, and, and their mind is open um, at the same time. So by the way, that gives a good opportunity to actually get people to work across uh, neighborhoods, communities, and so socioeconomic divides because it's one of those rare leveling experiences. Uh, so that's one, and then second, it sounds like it's the opposite way as though I think wherever you look, you see the biggest predictor of, of uh, divergent outcomes is just socioeconomic status. And you know, Anne Fernald, who, who you mentioned as well, did she does research which shows the power of, of, of what we can do now. She literally tracks eye movements um, as a predictor of, not a predictor, as a measure of, of cognitive development as early as I think maybe two 18, months. 18 maybe. months. Well, it's even earlier than that, I thought, oh. isn't it? I think it's like as early as six months. So anyway, quite early. And she's done tests in the U.S. and sees difference across socioeconomic divides. And she went to Mexico uh, and found, because she was working primarily with Hispanic population, did the same thing and did it in a high and low socioeconomic status and found the exact same divergence between the two populations. So I think that's the, you know, uh, why those of us who are here to care about social impact is parents, we all want the same thing for our kids no matter where we are. And, uh, you know, like exists in other fields, kind of where you're born, what family you're born into is the biggest predictor of success and I think we have the opportunity because we can reach people early and influence it and actually measure it and see how we can have an impact that we can actually fundamentally break that curve, uh, you know, that, that divergence at an earlier age. That's great. Well, thank you all so much. My father likes to say that you know you found a friend when your conversation isn't over. And I think this is the start <laughs> of a conversation, definitely not the end. Um, there's a lot of meat to dive into here. So please continue to engage with the panelists. Thank you to Gary Community Investments for putting this panel together. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you.